I am Christine. Welcome to Book Talk. Today we are discussing a huge release. Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, parts one and two. The eighth Harry Potter story. The script book that we've all been eagerly awaiting since it was announced that there was going to be a Harry Potter play. It's really a surreal moment to have this here. To have just read this book. What even? For those of you who don't know, there is a Harry Potter and the Cursed Child play, parts one and two, in London right now. The play is hopefully going to be in New York by 2017. I'm sure it'll slowly make its way around the world. For those of us who can't see it yet, we can now read it. The beautiful thing about this book, you can read it within a five hour period or less because it's a play. This story can only exist because of all the previous Harry Potter knowledge we have. The world is already set up. So we don't need to set it up like a usual fantasy novel. We can just take it for granted that we know exactly what they're talking about when we swirl from one scene to the next and from one place to the next. And we can visualize it so easily because we have eight movies worth of visuals in our head. It played out like a play in my mind, but with the characters from the movie. It's gonna be really interesting to actually see this play happen. There's magic in this. There's a lot of magic stuff. I'm at first visualizing it with CGI, and then I realized we don't have CGI. How are they performing this? How does it work? I really want to watch it. If you don't know, this takes place 19 years after the Battle of Hogwarts. We take off right where we left off. Literally, like the first page, I was reading the dialogue from the last page of Deathly Hallows, and I was like, what? What? I had so much fun reading this book. Did it hit me as emotionally and as deep as the Harry Potter books? No, but that doesn't mean that I didn't enjoy every second of it. I did cry and I'm just so happy it exists. I, I, I can't really tell you anything else. Like it definitely sits apart from the books. It's a different format. It's a different speed of storytelling. It's different. I don't know really where to place it on my Harry Potter rating line. I will look at it separately, I think. And if there does happen to be any other plays or Harry Potter stories in this format, I can compare it to that. I don't want to tell you what it reminded me of. I don't want to tell you anything. Just read it, have fun with it, enjoy it. This is new Harry Potter canon and <laughs> I'm gonna say goodbye to all you non-spoilery folk. Goodbye if you haven't read it yet. Go read it, come back, and we can discuss it together, okay? Goodbye, you guys. Goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. Just leave if you haven't read it. Okay, so all you folk out that have read the book. The script book. This Harry Potter book felt so, it felt like an episode of Misfits. If you watched Misfits, you know kind of the exact episode I'm talking about in season three with the Nazis, all that. Do you remember that episode? I don't even remember it clearly. I just know that this was reminding me of that. And then it was also reminding me of Doctor Who. It was like a very Whovian Misfits blend with Harry Potter. Like we always talk about the time turners and how they only showed up in that one book. It was like everything Joe knows about what we had questions swirling around in our brain. And she like put it all together in this book. It was a weird experience reading it because we've had like 10 years to theorize all this shit. And then to see some of it be canon, it's like, wow, to see it real. It was another whole thing. I mean, and I can't help but compare it to a very Potter musical. Like the plot of a very Potter sequel is like, they go back in time with a time turner, like Draco's dad to try to like change the outcome. I can't even remember because it's been so long. It's about going back in time. <laughs> and then there's one line in here. Albus goes, Uncle Ron won't find us this time. And then Ron walks on like, do I hear my name? Did somebody say Ron? What did we learn from the cursed child today? Mostly, teenage boys are f***ing idiots. I did not trust that Delphi bitch from the beginning. Her name was Delphi. It's ringing all these bells in my mind because of Percy Jackson and the Oracle of Delphi. And then she has an augury tattoo, which is another reference to prophecies and being able to tell the future. She was just surrounded by questionable nonsense with that name. These two boys decide that they want to go back in time, 20 years, and save this one boy, Robert Pattinson slash Cedric Diggory and they think they can do it by messing with the Triwizard Tournament. Right off the bat, I'm like, you have no idea what happened and what role Cedric played in that tournament. Your dad almost didn't make it to the cup at the end of the Triwizard Tournament. Cedric saved him and you're just, you're throwing everything, you're ruining it. Delphi is just like, oh yeah, I'll come with you, let's do it. 
I'm sitting here like, is this an adult? Like, is this an adult woman? How can an adult woman with a brain allow this to happen? This nonsense! The first weird, interesting clue that we get to where the plot is going here is we're on the Hogwarts Express and we meet Scorpius and he's like, yeah, you know, everyone hates me because of that rumor that my parents couldn't have kids and they were so desperate to reproduce a Malfoy pure blood heir that my mom got a time turner and time turned back in time and had sex with Voldemort and that I'm Voldemort's child. What the fun of all the people to have sex with to produce a pure blood heir. Why would anyone pick Voldemort? And the more we learn about his mom and about Scorpius, we know this isn't true. He's such a nice kid. He looks just like Draco. No. Scorpius is actually super cute. He's such a nerd and he follows the rules. I love how much he loves to learn. I mean, he's definitely my favorite new character in this book. Albus was so annoying. I just constantly wanted to push him over. I didn't choose him as my dad, you know? Like, just... Just stop. I loved seeing Rose Granger Weasley. She's so much like Hermione. It's hilarious and wonderful. You learn that what Hermione had was an hourly time turner and that there are different brands of time turner. Who knew? We never really explained how the time turner works. And I wish I knew. It feels like they're just hoping for a date and then the date happens. And you know, it's magic, not science. So, I mean, maybe that is how it works. It was immediately weird to me that Amos Diggory showed up at Harry's door door in the middle of the night because we knew Amos to be a reasonable man. But now we know at the end that Delphi probably confunded him into doing it. Or Imperios him into doing it. And then when we found out that Harry's scar was hurting, I literally put down the book and I was like, what the f***? We destroyed Voldemort. It was a hard knock life and we did it and we are done with that. I'm still kind of iffy on the explanation behind that because Harry Sky used to hurt because he's connected to Voldemort like he was a Horcrux. What is the reasoning now? Voldemort is completely dead. What magic is, is it just the possibility of an alternate timeline happening that's triggering the scar? There are a lot of like weird little things, but don't take that for me not enjoying this book because I did, and I'm glad it exists. And I know there are gonna be a lot of people that are like, she shouldn't have done anything, she should have just stopped, this is so weird and crazy. And I really think that the crazy things that happen in this book feel so crazy because of how fast we had to plow through them. If we had a long 800 page book to build up and reason all the little things that were weird that happened in here, it would have made much more sense in our heads. But because it had to go so quick, I think that really added this element of WTF to a lot of little things in the story. Like Harry starts having these weird prophetic dreams. And when he dreamed before, it was just like Voldemort's reality that he was seeing. He was seeing through Voldemort's eyes. But now in this book, he's having dreams like Percy Jackson does. Dreams from the Oracle of Delphi. It's very different from what we're used to. And it was just magic. You know, it was, there was no explanation for it. We just had to accept it. We get a little more background on a random character, the trolley witch. And apparently the trolley witch like literally just lives on the trolley and she protects it from students leaving. That was a weird scene. Scorpius and Albus are on top of the train and the trolley witch appears on the top of the train and it's like she's not human. She turns into some weird spike monster rolling after them. The whole thing felt very Percy Jackson to me. Was anyone else getting those vibes? So 19 years later, Ginny edits the sports section of the Daily Prophet. Hermione's the Minister of Magic. Oh my God, I was so proud. Like the first time she mentioned it, we couldn't tell if she was the Minister of Magic or if she was just referencing the minister. And then the second time I was like, oh shit. Girl! Slay. I'm sure Hermione is the best minister of magic that we've ever seen to date. Another little tidbit that kind of was like, what? The polyjuice potion that Delphi whipped up so that they could go impersonate Harry, Ron, and Hermione in the Ministry of Magic. And I'm like, we, we whipped them up too back in book two. And it takes like a month. Maybe Delphi had a secret stash of polyjuice potion. Maybe she already had it. She didn't just whip it up. Maybe she lied to the kids and the kids don't know how long it takes really to make. Because later on, Albus is like, why don't you Polyjuice potion into Voldemort. We just whips him up. I bet there's some ingredients down in Bathilda Bagshot's basement. And I'm like, sweetie, that's not how Polyjuice potion works. It takes a month to make that shit. It is not shake and bake. Whether or not Delphi had a stash of Polyjuice potion or she just like magically whipped it up, we didn't have any explanation or scene where the kids get a piece of hair or something from Ron, Harry, and Hermione. That's a huge deal. It was just so easy. All of a sudden they had transformed into them and they were on the ministry elevator and it was like, welcome Harry, Ron, Hermione. And I'm like, dude, Harry, Ron, and Hermione infiltrate 
infiltrated the Ministry of Magic years ago. Have you not tightened security? Why are you letting this happen? Hermione never found out. I wish there was a scene. Maybe there was and it got cut. Where Hermione found out when she was talking to Ron and was like, oh yeah, I saw you at work today and it tasted like you ate fish. What the heck was that blocking my door thing? Did you leave a stink bomb in there? She just never talked to him about that again. That was a weird thing he did. I wanted to see her discover that someone had impersonated him. This was the most surreal section, I think, of the play for me. They didn't get caught by Harry or Hermione, who is like the smartest witch in the world. And then they go into Hermione's office and she's hidden the time turner in like a book one protecting the sorcerer's stone sort of trap. Her books come to life and there are riddles and you have to solve the riddles to get to it. I mean, I feel like she would have locked that shit up in a tight ass vault inside a vault inside a vault inside a vault. Not a fun little game that she, Harry, and Ron could have broken back in school. The only time turner known to man right now is in her possession and she puts it in a riddled library bookcase. It just doesn't sound like something she would do. On a totally separate note, I really love to see how they did this scene in the play. I'm picturing bookshelves with arms reaching out of them. That's the only way I can picture them really doing this. The books can't physically reach out at them. There have to be arms, maybe arms wearing white gloves that look like pages and they like pull people into the bookcase. I don't know. It, it's gotta be a really crazy scene to act out. I need to see it. So then the boys go back for the first time. Delphi doesn't come and I'm super relieved because I'm like, she's pure evil. They come back to this new reality where Harry Potter's a hard ass and Albus is in Gryffindor, not Slytherin. And they go to defense against the dark arts and this blew my mind. Hermione was a defense against the dark arts teacher and she was Snape. And she was like 50 million points from Gryffindor. And I was like, what the? Ron had married Padma Patil and things were just a mess. Rose didn't exist. Ron and Hermione were clearly in love with each other, but like not aware of it. Ron was totes her Lily Potter. So the second time they go back in time, they go to the bathroom, they see Moaning Myrtle and they're like, one of these pipes must lead to the lake. And she's like, yeah, that sink right there. And this part confused the hell out of me. I don't know how it will be visualized in play form. Maybe that explains it, but it says that Albus climbs into a sink. Their plan is to go down the sink. Is sink like a different word in England? Is it like code for giant slide? He just disappears down the sink. Um, did he shrink? Like how did he get down the drain? I know there's a giant pipe for the snake when you move the sink aside and that goes into the chamber of secrets and there was no mention of them pushing the sink away and there being a pipe like that. I be he just said they climbed into the sink. I'm so confused! They both climbed into the sink? They go back, they embarrass Cedric, Scorpio emerges from the lake, and who do we run into? Umbridge, who is the new headmaster, and everything is gone to complete and total shit because Voldemort has taken over the world. Voldemort and Valor! This section was actually my favorite section of going through time. It was just so cool to see this alternate reality because we always think to ourselves, what would have happened if Voldemort would have won? And this is what would have happened, and it hurt. It hurt to see this shit. I made a mistake of bringing this book to Starbucks with me today. I finished part one, I got dressed, and I went to Starbucks to get a green tea latte with my book. There was a long line, and I wait online with my book, and I'm reading. I'm reading as I walk in, I'm reading, and I'm reading, like, <gasps> as I go through it, and I start to cry on the Starbucks line. <laughs> And then as we got further in, I'm waiting for my drink and I laughed aloud and I didn't realize I was laughing aloud in a public place surrounded by people. But the woman next to me was like, mm? and I was like, oh my God, just keep looking at the book. I can't right now. I can't. <laughs> in this favorite part, this dark alternate, what if Voldemort won the war reality? People say shit like, oh, Potter, I just stepped in dog crap. Potter just totes the new F word. So like when people insult other people or they're like, Potter you, man, Potter you. Christine, you're such a bookworm. Potter you, lady, I'm a book lion. We also learned that Cedric, because he was so humiliated, it hurt his soul so hard, he became a death eater. And then I guess, so loud when I read the line that said he killed Neville. This is about the part where I started crying because it burned. It burned to think that. How could 
Poor Robert Pattinson. Kill Neville Longbottom. How could we ever get to that point? And then we saw Snape. Did he just say Snape? And we go to potions class and Snape is there. And all the emotions. I was so emotional. And the first thing Scorpius says is, Snape, it's an honor. It's an honor to be in your presence. And he tells him about Harry and how he named his kid after him. Snape says, tell him I'm proud that he carries my name name and we never really get to see Snape once we know that he's actually a secretly a good guy and seeing him here was so nice it was so nice to hear him say those nice things and to be openly on Dumbledore's side he took up Lily's cause because he loved her but somewhere along the way he started believing in that cause as well it was such a beautiful moment I really think that was the strongest part of the play he takes Scorpius to their new headquarters and Hermione comes out. She's just a badass bitch warrior. I love it. She's wanted by the government. Her and Ron and Snape are really all that's left of Dumbledore's army that are still fighting for the cause. And Ron is all rugged and he's still a goofball but they're not together. And I love the moment where Scorpius tells them that they are together and they have two kids and we just have those really nice Ron and Hermione older versions that aren't together moments. And they sacrifice themselves together and he doesn't let her die alone and they get sucked, they get their souls sucked by Dementors, which is something we never really get to see. We never see it actually happen. People come close throughout the whole series, but this is dark shit. We see three people get their souls sucked. We have to watch Ron and Hermione die. We know that we're just gonna go back in time and zoom and do everything all over again really quickly, but we see it happen and we see Snape die again. And Snape realizing that he's dead in this new world. Who? Voldemort. How very irritating. <laughs> this is such a perfect Snape answer. I love when they first walk into headquarters and Snape goes, you're a terrible bore of a student and you're a terrible bore of whatever you are. And Hermione goes, I was an excellent student. You were moderate to average. <laughs> that is such bullshit, Snape. Stop. And Ron goes, so you're telling me that the whole of history rests on Neville Longbottom? <laughs> this part was loaded with just so many emotions and of course it's the part that I read out in public in Starbucks. When Snape hears that he's dead, he's like well at least I'm not married to him. And then we got this whole reveal, Delphi's evil, she takes the boys to try this one more time at the third task. And then Cedric comes and saves them. I kind of got teary in that moment too because Cedric was just there in front of us and we knew he was gonna die and there was nothing that they could do about it. And this part kind of got muddled up and it's probably more obvious in the video the five minutes runs out and the boys are like oh shit we have to touch it and then they miss it or she makes them just go back further I was a little confused because from what we know this time turner sets you back and you're only allowed to stay for five minutes so if you're only allowed to stay for five minutes were they holding on to the time turner the whole time they went anywhere else you know did they have a hand on it I'm confused or did they put their hand on it and they all went back to 1981 together but why didn't they go back after five minutes? I don't get it. I'm not sure. Like, I feel like that wasn't explained. How did they get stuck in time? Does it make you go back after five minutes and if you miss the train, you miss the train? I just feel like it was unclear. He never talked about them putting the necklace around themselves like they did in book three. And sometimes like five people go back in time. So I don't think they all fit under that necklace. So they've all got to touch it like a port key. I don't know. The mythology was muddled. And maybe with the visual, we always see how it works. So it works on the play stage. It was a little confusing in my brain. So they go back to 1981. They realize that they have to send Harry a message to tell him that they're here and they need help because Delphi is going to try to kill Harry. But I immediately was like, no, she's going to stop Voldemort. This is what initially weakened him and set him back 11 years on his quest for total world domination. The boys figure out that they can send Harry a message through Harry's blanket that he sees wrapped around baby Harry. This is another point that I'm like, they just skip over them writing on the blanket and go straight to Harry discovering the blanket with the message. And I'm like, how did they get that message on that blanket? How did they secretly sneak into Harry's room and unravel him from the blanket? How did they get into Harry's house and steal the blanket, write the message on it in whatever dust they needed to get it back around Harry and leave. It was a, I, it, 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 we needed to see that to believe it. I was just like, no. 
How? How? How did you do that? That was wrapped around a baby. Like, did you follow them around? And then weird, creepily steal Harry, baby Harry, like, pick up your dad? If there was a book, I'm sure that would have been a big quest. That's a big deal. But we brushed over it so quickly. Like, obviously, they were gonna get that message written on that blanket, wrapped around that baby with its two parents always watching it. You don't leave a baby alone. They must have broke into the house. Lily and James didn't notice, but Lily and James weren't really going out much. They only stayed in that house because they knew that Voldemort was after them. Like they were using that secret keeper charm. I just need an explanation. I just needed to see it. I really love seeing adult Draco and adult Harry interact. The duel that they have in Harry's kitchen was great. I enjoyed that a lot and I would love to see that in the play. And Ginny comes down and what did I miss? <laughs> it was like old times. So the crew all goes back together, meets Albus and Scorpius back on October 30th, and they decide the way to catch Delphi is to impersonate Voldemort, and to impersonate Voldemort, they are going to turn Harry into him, because Harry is the most experienced being in Voldemort's head. That makes sense. They did it though with transfiguration, which we've never really seen done extensively. Like when Ron was transfigured in book seven, they kind of just changed his features a little bit, but not his in entire demeanor. I don't know, it just wore off like Polyjuice Potion in, in that scene, which is also weird. Again, I wanna see how they do all these Polyjuice Potion scenes. There's so many scenes where people are transforming into other people. How are they doing this on the stage? I'm assuming that they're just switching out the actors, but then there's the scene where there's two Harrys and two Hermione's. Can you not see the other ones? Cause they're behind a door. I don't know. It's gonna be really interesting to see live. But anyway, they transfigure Harry look like Voldemort. And I'm like, so, I mean like, what version of Voldemort are we working with? We didn't really know what Voldemort looked like back in 1981, did we? We saw him come back as the noseless, shapeless blob in book four, but did he still, he looked kind of like a man back then. Do we have pictures of him? They make Harry look like like whatever version of Voldemort, I don't know. Maybe just the guy in the play. Maybe they're just basing it off of his appearance. Delphi comes and she's like, I am your daughter, you are my father. And she drops the bomb. And of course this was on all our heads. If Voldemort had a child now, who would it be with? Obviously our first thought is Bellatrix because she's creepily obsessed with him. And I always imagined that they had like their own little love story. And I always thought to myself, I'd love to see that love story. I think it'd be absolutely hilarious. And Joe, if you want to do another spinoff, please do that. The thing that threw me off was the timing of her birth. She was like, Bellatrix Lestrange had me before the Battle of Hogwarts. Before the battle. So she's like 22. I'm just like, you mean to tell me Bell we're supposed to believe that Bellatrix Lestrange was pregnant AF sometime between book six and the end of book seven. Where? We just, she's just wearing, I, what? I'm like, when I picture Bellatrix falling in love with Voldemort, I picture of them falling in love and maybe having relations back in the late 70s or something. <laughs> you mean to tell me somewhere in that hot mess of chaos and murder that she had sex with that scary nose loose one eighth of a soul snake man and got pregnant. I just, if, if there was a time, a chunk of time where we didn't see Bella Drake, and they, there must be, cause I'm sure Joe knows in her mind exactly when this happened. And if I knew when that happened, I would be like, oh, okay. But now I'm just like, we saw her before the Battle of Hogwarts so many times and I saw no pregnant belly. I saw no pregnant nothing. When did this happen? I need a date. I can't. I cannot visualize. Like the visual burns. But of course, this is also due to the fact that I am very much visualizing the films and the films could possibly not be accurately portraying the way that Joe visualized Bellatrix in the books. Like maybe she was wearing more baggy clothes in her mind and not a tight, really cool, witchy corset that we always saw Bellatrix in. Or maybe she was just like really good at hiding her pregnant belly like Claire is in Outlander because she wears a corset that goes to here and then her belly is is hidden under a giant dress. I don't know. Moving past this giant bomb of a bomb, Voldemort has a child. She's being put in Azkaban, but like, who knows when she could get loose. It happens all the time. And Malfoy just happened to have the original time turner. There's a lot of scenes that, I mean, I feel like this would have worked more realistically as a real book, not a play. Just because Harry Potter of the world just works better as a book because there's so much magic and because you need so much explanation 
frustration with so many things. I got emotional again watching Harry watch his parents die at the end. It, it, just seeing that scene again right in front of his eyes, knowing he could stop it, but he can't. It's so sad. And then, of course, right at the end, Scorpius asks Rose out. And in my mind, I immediately was like, oh, the Germione shippers, it's finally happening for you guys. The new generation. But still, I like that. Scorpius is so cute and so perfect for Rose. They're adorable together. This script, this play has given us a positive, nice, Slytherin character to look at. Scorpius is great. Albus, eh, a little moody. Now all we need is a book centered around a Hufflepuff and a book centered around a Ravenclaw. We really haven't had any main, main character Ravenclaws. Like, I know nothing about being a Ravenclaw, really. Okay? And that's my house. I'd really like that. I'd really like a character that's like in the trio that's a Ravenclaw. I think that's all my thoughts. I love to hear yours. Thank you so much for watching. This still feels so surreal. I'm Chris I make videos every Tuesday. I'm at XTMA on Twitter and Instagram. All my links are in the description below. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Goodbye!